guys. Well, good morning, New Zealand. <laughs> wow, the sunshine has come through. It is a great day today. Wow, is everybody happy? Everybody happy in Jesus today? Oh, this is so exciting. Phil, thank you so much for inviting me to be with you this morning and to preach. Very, very exciting to do that. So I wanted to at least clarify one thing. He said he didn't know if I was from Switzerland or France. Well, let me tell you, who's ever been to France or Switzerland? Raise your hand. Wow, we got some world travelers here. That's cool. Well, it is confusing because we live in France. I'm actually Franco-American. That means I'm American and also French. My wife is too. All of our three kids also. And we live in France exactly one kilometer from the border. Do you guys talk in kilometers or miles here? Miles. Okay, so we're about... <laughs> So anyway, we are really close, okay, to the border. Actually, we live on an alp. It's really rough living there. We live on the side of an alp at about 400 meters, look, 600 meters, looking down into Geneva, Switzerland. Ah, it's really, really rough. You know, I wake up every morning and I see Switzerland there and see the Alps. And we're, we actually live one hour from some of the best skiing in the world. I hear <laughs> no, it's really true. It's great. Ever heard of Chamonix? Yes. Well, that's one hour from our house. So it is really beautiful. So the church we started uh, nine years ago is in Geneva, but we live in France. So it is a little confusing, but if you come, we'll explain it to you, okay? So it's a lot of fun. Anyway, let me go ahead and pray, and then uh, we'll uh, bring up the topic that uh, I'm going to speak on this morning. Lord, thank you so much. What a great privilege it is to be here in Onikawa, Lord, and I just really, really pray that as we open your word today, that you would challenge us, especially in the whole area of evangelism and missions, which is the topic, Lord. Thank you for each and every person here who's here because one day someone had the courage of leading them to Christ. So do your work in our lives today. We thank you so much in Jesus' name. Amen. As you know, the topic of the conference is missions and evangelism. And um, my topic is more of missions, but this morning I'm going to do kind of both together. And um, as I presented some ideas, um, Phil suggested that I bring this message to you, which I've entitled, Our Sacred Duty to the Lost. Our Sacred Duty to the Lost. And I would like to really consider what that is. And I would like to start with a pretty powerful little point. If you have your Bibles, we're going to be actually going through Acts 6 and 7, but we're going to start with the last verse in the book of Isaiah. The last book, the last verse in the book of Isaiah. Isaiah 66 and verse 24. So go there, and I hope you will never forget this verse. It's an incredible verse, okay? Isaiah 66, 24. Isaiah ends his amazing prophecy describing the eternal state, which starts in verse 22. He describes heaven in verse 23, and he reads, and, and he describes hell in 24. I'm going to read verses 22. For just as the new heavens and the new earth, which I make, will endure before me, declares the Lord, so your offspring and your name will endure. And it shall be from the new moon to the new moon, and from Sabbath to Sabbath, all mankind will come to bow down before me, says the Lord. Now listen to verse 24. Then, they will go forth and look on the corpses of the men who have transgressed against me. For their worm will not die, and their fire will not be quenched, and they will be an abhorrence to all mankind. Now, I've read a lot of commentaries. Verse 24 describes hell. And that verse really troubles me. They will go forth and look on the corpses of men who have transgressed against me, and their worm will not die, their fire will not be quenched, and they will be an abhorrence to all mankind. Do you know that those in heaven will be able to see those who are suffering eternal damnation in the unquenchable flames of hell? That's what it says. You're going, what? 
That's what it says. Luke 13, 28. <clears throat> says this, in that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, listen to this, when you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but you yourselves being thrown out. Jesus is saying that those in hell will be able to see those in heaven. And Isaiah says that those in heaven will be able to see those in hell. But you say, but John, I, I, that's like terrible. Yes, it is. But at the same time, it will be a display of God's perfect justice. However difficult it may be to grasp from a human perspective, when that day comes, when we will see the wicked receiving their just retribution from a just and holy God, we will only bow down even more and worship Him and thank Him for His grace in our lives through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. I got cold chills thinking about this right now. I mean, I don't get this humanly speaking, but this is what it says. So I'm thinking, wow. If this is really true, and I'm not doubting it, if this is really true, what's my duty today? What am I called to do? Ezekiel 2.7, Ezekiel says this. He summarizes the whole thing. Let me just tell you. Ezekiel 2.7, But you shall speak my words to them, whether they listen or not. <laughs> Isn't that great? Ezekiel 2.7, but you shall speak my words to them whether they listen or not. You see, our sacred duty as Christians is to present to the lost the words of God with regards to the state of their soul and their eternal destiny. We must proclaim Christ and Christ crucified to all that they might be confronted with the reality of their sin, the wages of their, of their sin, the eternal state of condemnation if they die in their sin. And we must also explain to them that they can be forgiven from their sin. They can be spared hell and be given eternal life if they trust Jesus Christ. Sorry, I didn't mean to start like so heavy, but I mean, I just want to grab your attention. Is your attention grabbed? <laughs> it's like, I mean, it blows me away, this stuff. I mean, it really is. It's like the Bible. It's like, whoa, no wonder people don't like it. And that's pretty radical stuff. We just, that was just like the first three minutes. I mean, it's like heaven and hell. It's there. You can't deny it. I'll be real honest. I hate the doctrine of hell. I mean, I hate it humanly speaking, but it's there. If hell doesn't exist, why did Christ die on the cross? For what? So, <clears throat> now i got to preach the sermon. Okay? <laughs> Let me tell you something. Evangelism is really hard. I'm a professional missionary. <laughs> it is really hard for me to evangelize. It is. I get scared just like everybody else. I get tongue-tied. I go, ah, should I? Are they going to be offended? You know, do I really bring out Christ now? You know, the best way to kill a good conversation is to mention Jesus. It's like, end of conversation. Oh, no. You tell them you're a pastor, a missionary. Eh. You know, they just like, oh, now what do we talk about? So I, I'm just like everybody else. It's hard. Because it's hard for me, I need to be inspired by examples in the Scripture. That's what we're going to do today. I would like to look at the life of Stephen. Stephen is a great guy, okay? And uh, he's in Acts 6 and 7, and uh, his story will hopefully be an inspiration for all of us, if you're scared and nervous, to not forget that there's something that we must do, and that is proclaim the gospel around us. Why Stephen? Because not only was he a great witness, but because he was the first martyr of the Christian church. First one. The first Christian to be martyred. It's this guy. 
Do you know why he was martyred? I'll tell you why. Because he took the mandate of proclaiming Christ seriously and he dared confront sinners with the truth. And you know what? It cost him his life. So my question is this. Do we take the mandate seriously and are we willing to pay the price to do the same thing? That's the question. His name means crown, Stephanos. It is a Greek name which means, um, well, crown, because I just said it, okay? But because he was crowned, crowned as the church's first martyr. And what I like about him is that we'll find certain qualities in his life that help us understand how we can be um, good witnesses like him, okay? So with that, let's start in Acts. And we're going to go to the book of Acts, but you're probably already there. Sorry, I don't have my regular Bible. I borrowed this one because my eyes are starting to have some issues. So I need bigger print Bible. It's just got a really weird thing. But anyway, that is what happens as you get older in life. So we're in Acts chapter 6, and I would like to show you seven qualities from the life of Stephen that makes him a great evangelist. Number one, number one, this will surprise you. He was based in the church. By the way, all the points start with B, okay? So it'll be easy to follow. Number one, he is based in the church. He's based in the church. Let me just give you a quick uh, summary before we get to actually our text. In Acts 1.5, our resurrected Lord is speaking with his disciples just before he physically ascends into heaven, and he promised to send them the Holy Spirit. And in Acts 1 8, I'm sorry, I meant Acts 1 5. In Acts 1 8, it says this, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, and even to the remotest part of the earth. So he explains that he's going to give them the Holy Spirit with a goal to become effective witnesses around the world. So that's why he's going to send them the Holy Spirit, which implies right there at the beginning of the book of Acts that Jesus wants us to be witnesses. He wants us to be witnesses. And this is important because Stephen becomes one of the primary first examples. In chapter 2, you remember, the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit comes. Peter preaches a powerful message, starting at 14 and ending at verse 41. The result of this sermon, Acts 2, 41, so then those who had received... His word were baptized, and they were added to that day about 3,000 souls. Can you imagine preaching one sermon, seeing 3,000 people get saved? I've never seen that. That'd be really cool. Then in chapter 3, in Acts chapter 4, 4, another sermon, but many of those who had heard the message believed, and the number of the men came to about 5,000. We've got a massive church that just was birthed. So the cumulative total is what? Between five and 8,000 people. So with all this growth, there's some challenges, and as I mentioned yesterday, verse 1, in chapter 6, they were increasing, the disciples were increasing, but there were problems, and you remember that some of these widows were being neglected in distribution of food, the church was growing so much. And so in chapter 6, verse 2, I referred to this yesterday also, the twelve summoned the congregation of the disciples and said, it is not desirable for us to neglect the word of God in order to serve tables. Therefore, brethren, select among you seven men of good reputation, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we may put in charge of this task, but we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. The statement found approval with the whole congregation, and they chose, number one on the list, Stephen. Number two on the list was our guy from yesterday, Philip. So Stephen is picked as number one, a man of good reputation, a man full of the spirit, a man full of wisdom. I'm thinking to myself, wow, okay, so to be the first guy picked for this job must have been a man with a great reputation. That's what it says. A very godly man. The first man on the list of maybe what? Up to 10,000 people. First guy picked for this task. Look at verse 3. In Acts 6, 3, it says, Therefore, brethren, select, and this is the key, from 
among you, among you, literally men of you. Now, the reason I'm saying this is because what we see about Stephen as we start our sermon here is that Stephen was found inside the church. He was a local church guy. All he was and all the ministry he did outside the church flowed out from a deep-seated commitment to the local church. He never complains about the task he has to do in the church, serving widows. He accepts it with joy. You know, so many people I, I meet, they want to go win the world for Christ, but they don't want to serve like even in a menial task in the church. It's like that's not important. Or that's like, that, you know, I'm, I'm too good for that. No, you start there. It's like in Acts 13. You know, Paul is the greatest missionary of all time, right? Acts 13, 1, what do we read? Now there were at Antioch in the church that was there, prophets and teachers, Barnabas and Simeon, who was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene, and Menean, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul, while they were ministering to the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. When they had fasted and prayed, they laid their hands on them and they sent them away. It's interesting. Paul and Barnabas, you know what they were doing before he became those greatest missionaries of all time? They were serving in the church. Paul was just a guy in the church. Pretty smart guy. But he was a guy in the church. And when they came back from their missionary journeys, they came back to the church. So, why is this point important? Why is it important to be a local church person? Because it's in the church that the word is preached. It's in the church that character is evaluated. See, it's in the church that people look at you and they go, hey, what kind of person are you? It's in the church that elders are to be respected. It produces humility. It's in the church that sin is disciplined. This produces fear and holiness. It's in the church that gifts are put to use. That produces training. It's in the church that new believers are discipled. That produces the new blood to carry on the work until the Lord returns. It's in the church that the Lord Jesus Christ is active. He said, I will build my church. And Christ builds his church through local assemblies. You see, the local church is key. I was thrilled to walk in today. It was empty at first. It was cold also. Man, it's cold. You guys are rough, tough people, man. I'm just really impressed. And it was like an empty church. And, um, and then at about 5 to 10, 10 o'clock, you guys packed the place out. I just couldn't even believe it. I was thrilled. Overflow room, overflow hallway. I took pictures. I can't wait to take pictures back. Go in Geneva. Guys, this is what we want to see. Overflow, packed local church. I think it's great. I, I, I really commend you. I, it's just so neat. Like all these people, front row, front rows were all taken up. So neat. Oh, back rows, okay. I, you know, back row Christians are okay too, guys. <laughs> <laughs> but it's important to be local church people. So, number one point, you guys are doing it. Fantastic. Number two. Number second point to be a great evangelist. You must be, and he was, bridged to the world. Bridged to the world. Back in Acts chapter 6, verse 7. The word of God kept spreading, and the number of the disciples continued to increase greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests were becoming obedient to the faith. And Stephen, there's our guy, full of grace and power, was performing great wonders and signs, listen to this, among the people. Among the people. I love this little verse. It says the word was spreading. So there was a church, they were serving in the church, and the word of God was spreading, right? More and more people were coming to faith. It says it was increasing greatly, including a great many priests. There was a revival in their religious establishment. Miracles were being performed. Stephen, Peter, John, they all received the gift of miracles. They were using them as a means to authenticate the gospel message. And it says in verse 8 that Stephen was among the people. This is what I like about Stephen. He's balanced. He's balanced. We have almost more information about Stephen in those three words than in the rest of the chapter. These words are loaded. Yes, he was totally committed to the local church, and he served faithfully. But you know what? 
didn't stop there. He never forgot his God-ordained duty to be in the world, to reach the world. Where was he? Among the people. Among the people. Okay, here's the incredible principle. Are you ready? Here it is. To reach the lost, you must be with the lost. That's radical, isn't it? If you want to reach the lost, where are you going to find them? Or where do they live? Got to be with the lost. This is true of Jesus himself. In Matthew 9, <clears throat> verse 35, Jesus was going through all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. Seeing the people, he felt compassion for them because they were distressed and dispirited like sheep without a shepherd. And he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Therefore, beseech the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. See, where was Jesus? Jesus was in the villages. He was with the people. You know, he wasn't just sitting in a church waiting for people to come. And this is what we often do, and I'm guilty of this too. You know, I'm, I'm telling myself, okay, wait. Guys, bring your friends. You know, bring your friends to church. Well, that's good, but Jesus didn't just sit around waiting for people to come. He went to them. And you know what happens when you go where people are and you spend time with people? Well, you start having compassion with them, for them. That's what Jesus says. Seeing the people, verse 36, he felt compassion. Now, that word is very interesting in Greek. You know what it is? Let me tell you. Splagna. Splagna. Do you know why? Because it describes the, the, the bowels, the gut of a person. Have you ever been in a situation where, like, you see something really gross, and it's like, ooh, you ever had that feeling? Splagna. That's splagna. Great word. So it says that Jesus had splagna. His guts were wrenched when he saw the misery of the people he was seeing and with. You see, when you spend time with people in cities and villages, and you begin to talk to them, you begin to hear their stories, and you begin to see their misery and their problems, the effect of sin in their lives. You see broken lives, helpless lives, frustrated people, busted up families and marriages, frustrated parents and children, depressed people, divorced people, separated people, lonely people, sick people, hopeless people, drugged up people, perverted people. And you see mostly people who are completely spiritually lost, trying to figure it out. And if you spend enough time with them, your heart breaks. You feel bad for them. Years ago, my wife and I, my wife Meg and I have been married 33 years. This must have been in the first few years of our marriage, but I've never forgotten this. We were somewhere in L.A. in our car. We came to a red light, and we saw this dog that had a like bloody paw. It had been hit by a car or something, and it was going up and down the sidewalk, and as people were walking and getting scared of this kind of bloody dog, the dog would, would start following the person looking for compassion. Goes, hoo, 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 hoo. And the person would get scared and they'd run. So another person would come and the dog would turn around and go, hoo, 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 hoo. I don't do dog sounds very well. But anyway, <laughs> but he, th this dog would just follow people. And so we were watching this, waiting for the light to turn green. And we started feeling really bad for this dog. And... Um, we were talking, we thought, maybe we should help the dog. I'm going, wait a minute. I want to help this stray dog. So we decided, let's, let's help the dog. So we opened the door of our car, and we go, hi, dog. <laughs> the dog just, like, comes to us, the friendliest dog. And he starts licking us. And I'm going, I can't believe we're doing this. It's like, this is a stray dog licking me with his bloody paw. And it was like well, the weirdest thing. And you know, as we were now involved in this dog's life, guess what happened? Splagna. 
<laughs> I'm feeling really bad, splonkinated for this dog, you know? And my wife, too. And now, we're, now we're, we're too far gone. We've, we've got to help it. So we say, let's help the dog. So you know what we do? We go get a blanket on the back of our trunk, put the blanket in the back seat. I pick up this dog. I do, really. With this bloody paw, I'm going, I can't believe I'm doing this. And I put the dog in the car. We take it to the vet. We didn't know where the vet was, but we found one. When we got to the vet, our lives were totally involved with this dog. We gave the dog to the vet, and then we cried. <laughs> and then I thought to myself, John, you did this for a dog. Would you do it for a person? Well, I know a guy who did this for a person, a guy in Uganda. And uh, he got to an accident. There are no hospitals like there are here. And someone had been hit, a guy on a scooter had been hit, and his leg had been chopped off. And uh, this missionary saw this, and he knew the guy only had minutes to live. Do I do something or not? He took the guy, put him in his car, rushed him to the hospital. They'd be able to save his life. He ended up, the guy's family just t totally lost. You know, they, they cut, when, when you're crippled like that, they'll cut you off. And um, so he took him back to his house, helped him get well, led him to Christ. And today he's a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ. Would I have done that? I'm not sure I would have, honestly. What's the point here? The point is, if we're going to reach people, where are we going to find them? Where they are. Where they are. And so I've endeavored in my life as a pastor. This is a real problem for pastors because you know, we're always in the church. We're always helping Christians. How do we spend time in the world so that we might feel splogging to be able to help and proclaim the gospel? This is what I love about Stephen. He had a balanced life. He was in the church, and then he was outside the church. Number three. So first, he was based in the church. Number two, bridge to the world. Number three, he was bathed in the word. Bathed in the Word. Do you know what happens when you start spending time with people in the world, with non-Christians, when you start spending time among the people? Well, opportunities to share the gospel will just pop up everywhere. And you'd better be ready when those opportunities come up. Chapter 6, we're back in Acts. Verse 8. <clears throat> And Stephen, full of grace and power, was performing great wonders and signs among the people. But some men from what was called the synagogue of the freedmen, including both Cyrenians and Alexandrians, and some from Cilicia and Asia, rose up and argued with Stephen. But they were unable to cope with the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. And they secretly induced men to say, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes and they came up to him and dragged him away and brought him before the council. They put forth false witnesses who said, this man incessantly speaks against his holy place and the law. And we have heard him say that this Nazarene Jesus will destroy this place and alter the customs which Moses handed down to us. And fixing their gaze on him, all who were sitting on the council saw his face like the face of of an angel. You see, as Stephen was in the world, suddenly the opportunity popped up as he was talking and speaking, and of course they blamed him of being illegal. But the opportunity popped up. Opposition popped up. And they began to dispute and debate with him. They bring in false witnesses. They stir up a crowd against him in verse 12. They came upon him and physically. They dragged him away, brought him before the council, put forth more false witnesses, and now his face is shining like that of an angel. That's kind of weird, isn't it? So here he is, falsely accused, pushed around, shaken up, tension to the max, ready to be lynched by the mob, and in chapter 7, verse 1, the most amazing question. The high priest said, are these things so? Folks, this is the question of all questions. As you're with people, 
And as they start hearing you talk, someone at some point is going to go, uh, is that really true? What you're saying about Christ? Is that really true what you're saying about God? Really? What an opportunity. What an invitation. You see, when that question comes, and it will, believe me, it will, because people are so beat up that when they see someone like you walk around who's got their life together because Christ has changed them, eventually they will say, hey, what happened? Why are you different? Then you got to be ready to answer. So you know what he does? <laughs> it's amazing. They say, are these things so? Oh, let me answer. He preaches a sermon of 53 verses. That's what he does. He answers the question by launching into this amazing sermon, which is actually the longest sermon in the book of Acts. And please note, he has no Bible in his hand. This is all from memory. So I'm not going to go over the sermon. It's long. But he, he breaks up the sermon, eight points. The history of, number one, Abraham, verse two, Isaac, verse eight, Jacob, verse eight, Joseph, verse nine, Moses, verse 20, Joshua, verse 45, David, verse 45, Solomon, verse 47. And what he was doing, just summarizing this, he says, God spoke through all these great prophets of the past, and you Jews who are about to lynch me know it very well. So what could they say about that? They knew that these men were men of God, and the Jews believed that. So all was good. But then in verses 51 to 53 that we'll look in a second, he comes back, and he tells them that they needed to repent and accept the very one these prophets announced, Jesus the righteous one. So he goes through the prophets and he says, all these guys talked about the Messiah and I'm proclaiming to you who Jesus Christ is. He is the Messiah. You need to repent. Now what I want to see in this point is simply that this man, Stephen, knew the basic Bible facts. He just knew his Bible. He was bathed in the word. He was able to whip out this sermon just spontaneously, all these verses reviewing the whole history of Israel. And I'm impressed. Now, yesterday I said that you can share the gospel just with one verse in five minutes and a little bit of courage. And I believe that. That's true. That's how I was brought to Christ. But it shouldn't stop there. We should know our Bible well enough so that as issues come up, we're able to speak to those issues. And this is what he does. He's with a Jewish crowd, and he speaks to them in Jewish language by reviewing their history. First Peter 3.15 says, Always be ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you with gentleness and reverence. So, I ask you, do you know your Bible? Do you have like a reading plan? You know, for years I would read my Bible once a year. A little thing, and I, I still actually do. It's just it's a little different right now. I've come up with a different system, but uh, we should always be reading our Bibles. Just read your Bible. Try and read it once a year. Why not? It's great. Just have the understand it. Are there evangelism classes maybe that can be taken? Just ways to learn your Bible, to be ready, just like him. Number four. Number four. He was bold to the point. Wow, this is amazing. We're at chapter 7, verse 51. Chapter 7, verse 51. This is how he ends his sermon, okay? He just reviewed the names of these great men of the past, and he says here, You men who are stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears are always resisting the Holy Spirit. You are doing just as your fathers did. Which one of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? They killed those who had previously announced the coming of the righteous one, who betrayers and murderers you have now become. You who received the law as ordained by angels and yet did not keep it. Okay, how do you feel about this conclusion? They're saying, hey, uh, Stephen, what do you think? Is this so? He goes in this massive sermon and ends this way. Let me modernize this. Suppose you're with someone that you're talking, a friend or maybe your neighbor or someone you know, and you've explained the gospel, and you end it this way. This is the way you end it with your neighbor. I'm, I'm kind of paraphrasing what he just said. 
Suppose your friend's name is Joe. Well, give me a really good New Zealand name. Give me a really good New Zealand name. Bruce. Bruce. Uh, maybe I should stick, uh, stick with Joe, okay? No, is that okay? Let's just go with Joe, okay? Okay. Bruce. Is it Bruce better? Bruce. There's something I don't know here, okay? All right. Okay, Bruce, you are stiff-necked. <laughs> you are uncircumcised of heart. You might try this if you don't like that particular one. You are a rotten, dirty sinner in the hands of an angry God. Joe, I have noticed that you are always resisting the Holy Spirit. Oh, no, I'm sorry, it's Bruce. In fact, Bruce, you are no different than your father and grandfather who reprobate Christ rejectors. In fact, Bruce, your ancestors are murderers since they basically killed the prophets who had announced the coming of Christ. Bruce, you are a betrayer, you are a murderer, you are nothing but a lawbreaker. That is right, Bruce, you continually break the law that was ordained by angels. What do you think of that conclusion? <laughs> you ever tried it? <laughs> it's a way to lose friends. <laughs> But isn't that interesting? Now, I'm not saying you should all go home and try this on your neighbors today, but why not? I mean, ultimately, this is what Stephen is doing. He's pretty bold here. He's not scared. He's not beating around the bush. He's saying, look, you guys are sinners, and you must repent of your sin. And he's not scared to point the finger at the sin. Now, confession time. I'm a professional missionary. You know how many times I have fudged the gospel? How many times the opportunity was right there for me to say, you know what, you are in sin before God. And this particular area in your life, God is going to judge. When I go, oh, yeah. mm, ah, you know, it's like, oh, Jesus loves you. Well, that's true too. But it's hard, isn't it, to confront someone. And yet this is what he does. This is what he does. Now, I thank the guy in New Delhi that brought me to Christ. He confronted me and told me I was hellbound. So all I'm just saying is that we need to be a little more courageous sometimes in preaching the whole gospel. If people don't recognize their sin is an offense to a holy God, they can't get saved. Stephen took a risk. Number five, he paid dearly for this. Number five, he was bloodied by the mob. He was bloodied by the mob. Chapter 7, verse 54. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the quick. Can you imagine? Of course. He just called them a bunch of murderers. They were cut to the quick and they began gnashing their teeth at him. That means this. You're so angry. That's what gnashing means. Okay? Have you ever been angry like that before? And just want to kill. Well, they want to kill. That's exactly what they want to do. And being full of the Holy Spirit, he gazed intently into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. And they cried out with loud voices and covered their ears and rushed at him with one impulse. And when they had driven him out of the city, they began stoning him. And the witnesses laid aside their robes at the feet of a young man named Saul. And they went on stoning Stephen as he called on the Lord and said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then falling on his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. Having said this, he fell asleep. Now, I've often thought about the idea of being stoned. I mean, here you are, you've got this mob, they've just grabbed all these stones, and you're here in a corner, and you're stuck. And you're looking around, and everyone's there holding their stones. Maybe there's 20, 30, 40 people there. And you're just thinking, no way, this is not really happening to me. And you're waiting, and the, they're, they're, who's going to throw that first stone? Are they going to hit you or not? Are you dreaming? Is this really for real? And suddenly, whammo, boom, a, a stone hits you right here, and you're going, what just happened? And then whammo, another stone hits you and hits you here, and one passes by you. So you start covering your face, and stones start hitting you, and they start hitting you, and they start hitting you. And then you faint, fall down like him. I mean, I just can't even imagine what being stoned to death is really like. But this is what happened to him. It says they began stoning him in verse 58, and they went on stoning Stephen. This took a little while. It was a process. And when he collapsed down, they just kept stoning him until he was dead, aiming for his head. And he knew he was done. At one point it says, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit.
That's scary. You know, as I mentioned yesterday, I've never shed a blood for the, a drop of blood for the gospel. That, that's really scary. I look at stories like that and go, you know, would I, would I really be able to handle that? I don't know. He did. And you know why? You know why this happened to him? Because he preached the whole gospel. You see, if he had withheld the last part, if he had just reviewed the history of the Messiah through the prophets and said, hey, you need to believe in Jesus. But if he had not said, you men are stiff-necked and uncircumcised and hard and ears and always resisting the Holy Spirit, you are doing just as your fathers did. Which one of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? They kill those who had previously announced the coming of the righteous one whose betrayers and murderers you have now become. You who received the law as ordained by angels and yet did not keep it. If he had not said that, he would not have been killed. If he had compromised the gospel just a little bit, it would have been okay. But he didn't compromise the gospel. I'm speaking to myself here. I have many times compromised the gospel. Because I'm ashamed of the gospel. Romans 1.16. Sometimes I am. And I'm a professional. That's scary. So let me ask you a trick question. This is point six. He was bent towards success. Let me ask you this very tricky question. Do you think Stephen was a successful evangelist? <laughs> trick question. You're probably all saying, well, of course. He's the first martyr, long sermon, died for the gospel. Very successful, right? I agree. Plus, he was based in the church, bridge to the world, bathed in the word, bold with the point, bloodied by the mob. Okay, but I ask you this question. How many people actually came to Christ through his ministry? We don't know. We have no idea. Paul was influenced by this incident. He was there. But actually, he may have led no one to Christ. Was he successful? Good question, don't you think? Yes, he was. Why? Not because he saw many people come to Christ. That's our desired result of an evangelist. But because he preached the gospel faithfully. Jeremiah preached Faithfully also saw one person, maybe, believe his message. Pretty neat to think about that. My duty is not to bring people to Christ, so that's my desire. My duty is to proclaim the gospel faithfully. Number six, he was blessed by the Lord. Wow, what an exaltation. Chapter 7, verse 55, but being full of the Holy Spirit, he gazed intently into heaven, saw the glory of God, and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Wow. You know what? It says, the Bible says, Jesus is seated at the right hand of God, but when a martyr is raised to heaven, it says he stands up. Jesus is there standing up to receive Stephen into heaven. Blessed by the Lord. So he was bathed in the church, bridged to the world, bathed in the word, bold with the point, bloodied by the mob, bent towards success, and blessed by the Lord. Why? Well, for those reasons. For those reasons. So the question is, how are you doing in this area? Let me tell you a story and end with this. 14 years ago, well, about 13 years ago, <clears throat> I was in my kitchen. I love evangelism, but uh, nothing was happening. I was not really in a particular evangelistic mode. And I get this phone call from this guy in America. He says, hi, my name is so-and-so. How would you like to be the chaplain of a hockey team? I'm going, excuse me? He says, yeah, uh, how would you like to be the chaplain of a hockey team? I said, I'm sorry, you probably got the wrong number. And he goes, no, 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 we don't have the wrong number. Uh, he says, a very wealthy American just bought six hockey teams, uh, and the Geneva hockey team is a prime team. And he said he was a Christian, and he wanted a, a chaplain, and so we did research, and we found you, and we think you'd be the perfect chaplain. I said, is this a joke? 
I said, I don't even like sports. He says, perfect. I said, perfect. He goes, yeah, we don't want anyone with ulterior motives. Like, you know, I'm not into pictures with, you know, hockey players. It's not really my thing. He said, we just want someone who, who wants to be with hockey players and, and lead them to Christ. I thought, this is like crazy. I said, okay. So I went down, met the coach. I was like really nervous. And he, the coach and I really hit it off. His name was Chris McSorley. He said, come on in and meet the team. <laughs> I'd never been in a hockey locker room before. It really stinks. <laughs> it's unbelievable, man. I walked in, there's like, whoa, you know. And I'm going, what do I say? So I prepared my four-minute my four minute talk for like hours, and I, I went in there, and I kind of gave my spiel. And they, I thought they were going to like chuck me out of there, you know, in the two seconds, but they didn't. And so for the first year, I was so nervous. It would take all the courage I had just to walk in the locker room, go around the room, say hi to the guys, and leave. And I would like be drenched in sweat. I was so nervous just to do that because it wasn't my world. You know, I mean, I don't know anything about hockey and locker rooms and hockey players and stuff. Year two, I began to give chapels. And uh, a couple of guys, well, first year, no one came. Second year, a couple of guys came. So I kept doing chapels, kept going to see the guys. And then we had a great idea. My wife makes the best brownies in the history of the universe, okay? And so I take them brownies, and now it's like I'm really, really welcome. So they love the brownies. So now I always go with brownies. They just love the brownies. But, you know, I've been there for 13 years. You know what? You know how many people have come to Christ in that ministry? Zero. Not one person has ever come to Christ. Ever. So I think of Stephen. It doesn't matter. That's not my job. My job is just to try the best I can to proclaim the gospel to these guys. Well, this made the news in Switzerland. First chaplain in the history of Switzerland. They did a news report. It's two minutes long. Do you want to see it? Here we go. Let's throw it. This is a news report done by the Swiss television on the hockey ministry in Geneva. Here we go. In sports still, but this time in the world of hockey, it is a unique situation in Switzerland. The players of the Geneva Servette hockey team have at their disposal a chaplain, a pastor. It is a rare thing in Europe, but this position is rather common in overseas clubs, and it is, in fact, the American owner of the Servette club that imposed it at the Geneva rink. Reporting are Annelies von Bergen and Marilo Machila. Less than two years ago, this man could not have imagined becoming so enthusiastic about hockey players. But for several months now, he does not miss a game of the Geneva Servette team at the rink. In his role as spiritual counselor, John Glass has become very attached to these professionals of the ice. Personally, I like the bottle administration. I perceive myself as one of the bottles of these players, but a spiritual bottle. I don't impose myself on anyone. But if they're thirsty, they have questions, if they want to talk to someone, they're free to come and see me. Pastor of an evangelical church in Geneva, John Glass functions as the team chaplain according to the desire of the American owner of the Geneva Hockey Club. Because of his personality and his discreet presence, John Glass has gained the friendship of the players and the coach. The experience so far has been a very positive experience. I don't uh, personally go to the classes because I think the players need a break from the coach. But personally, I use John. John and I have many lunches and many meetings together, and whether it's a coach or a player, we can all use somebody to listen. Every two weeks, just after practice, John Glass offers a meeting of about 20 minutes, regularly attended by five to six players. I'm not here to make a direct link between hockey and the Bible. Rather, I'm here to help these men who may have concerns or trials and how to manage them and move forward in life. For me, this is my first experience with this program, but I think it is quite good, and it allows us to share our opinions with someone else from another world. We talk about uh, issues with whether it's hockey or whether it's our lives, marriage or raising families or whatever it is, and uh, it's a good way for us to to have uh, some religion. I understand perfectly well how some people could use these kind of services. Do you use the services? <laughs> No, but as long as it stays optional, it's good. Personally, I do not need to go see a chaplain or psychologist. Sports and religion may seem to be two very different worlds, but as this experience shows, human preoccupations often go deeper than athletic challenges. 
Okay, so I'm also a psychologist, okay? <laughs> but you know, I, I show you this, and I'm going to end here. You know, that's what God gave me. I mean, I, I was not expecting that. My question to you is, where has God placed you? Where has God placed you? Who are the circle of people that don't know Christ in your world? Will you pray that God will help you just be a little bolder toward them? It's scary, I know. But may God use you just to be a little bolder and to be a Stephen. Amen? Lord, we thank you so much for the life of Stephen. Inspire us, I pray, in Jesus' name. Amen.